Welcome, 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 geeks and nerds, girls and boys, to a brand new episode of geek to me Radio. Tonight, we have comic icon Jerry Ordway joining us to discuss the return of Superman, 30th anniversary, out in comic book stores now. We'll talk about his run on the original series. All that and more, stand by. And for those of you who are listening to us on the Big 550 KTRS here in the greater St. Louis area, we appreciate all of you finding us on this Thanksgiving weekend as it ends the Thanksgiving holiday and we roll into December. And of course, if you're hearing us online, streaming us out there in the world, hello to all of you. Maybe you're in, I always say driving around the greater St. Louis area. Maybe you're listening to us tucked away at home on your radio. Maybe you like that AM crackle at home. Uh, Some of you might not have radios in your houses anymore, so you're listening to us on the KTRS app or you're streaming us on your laptop. No matter how you're listening, how you found us, we appreciate you tuning in on this long Thanksgiving weekend's Sunday. And hopefully you had a lot to be thankful for, have a lot to be thankful for. And I know I'm thankful for all of you who listen every week, and I do appreciate you supporting this show. It means a lot to me, believe me. Um, We have a great show tonight. I am not in studio Uh, Joey V is off with his family out of state. I finished a long weekend of Christmas tradition, so I could not bring myself to be in the studio. But as always, I don't leave you with a boring best of or something like that. This is a brand new show with a fantastic guest. Jerry Ordway has graced my show many times in the past. We just had him on last year talking about the 30th anniversary of the death of of Superman. He graciously agreed to come back and join us to talk about his work on the 30th anniversary of the return of Superman. We're going to get into that now. I'm joined once again by writer and artist Jerry Ordway talking about the 30th anniversary of the return of Superman. You may recall that last year we had him on to talk about the 30th anniversary of the death of Superman. Of course, we're celebrating his return now. Uh, Jerry, I appreciate your time tonight. Thanks for thanks for asking. Of course, <laughs> I'm like the I'm like the guy who you know I show up once a year like the groundhog. <laughs> <laughs> much much better dressed from what I've seen than uh, Paul Kentucky Pete or whatever his name is. I can't remember the name of the groundhog now. Um, but no, it's it's great that uh, a that you you're you're involved in all these things. I'm glad to see DC honoring the legacy of Superman by bringing you and Louise and Dan and Brett back for this particular thing. When they announced that you guys were going to be doing the death of it, did they just say, Hey, by the way, and tell you right then and there, you're doing the return as well. (laughs) Actually, it is funny though. When I finished the, my story in the death of Superman special, I told the editor, I said, you know, next year you can do the return of Superman special. (laughs) I don't know if that had anything to do with it, but, but it was certainly an obvious, uh, you know, an obvious move because I think the, the both those stories were very impactful. You yeah. Know? And I think fans still either have come upon it years later or they remember it from, you know, the the days of uh, the early 90s. Um, and it certainly is one of those iconic stories because it's like just with anything, the, the death of a comic book character. We all know comic book characters don't stay dead. Certainly they wouldn't keep Superman dead. Uh, back then but it was cool to see these four new characters which have continued on so well you think like a lot of times one of these things will come up it'll be a storyline a one and done character you may see them pop up occasionally but obviously jonathan kent's gone on to do a lot of stuff uh uh, john henry irons is still going strong has his own book now in the dawn of the dc again and when you're working on characters like this did you get uh attached to 
certain characters? You try not to do that when you're writing, creating new characters. No, I think it's natural for you to be attached to them because, I mean, I, I don't think we ever came up with stuff that was just, oh, quick, throw this character or throw something in here. We need something. Mm. I mean, most of the stuff that we did even back in the day, especially back in the day, we would try to build out characters. Um, they usually had some kind of build up and they usually had some background or something tied to some, you know, specific events and stuff. So I think, you, you know, it's hard not to feel, uh, you know, like uh, some sort of sense of ownership or, or you know, whatever sympathy. I, I always feel that when I when I don't see characters that I worked on, mm. you know, used. I think um, I always think of Bibbo. I think of gangbuster characters <laughs> that, you know, really nobody generally nobody picked up the ball and, and, and did them. And maybe they were just too personal to me. Maybe that, uh, you know, someone else uh, it may not have been comfortable doing it. I don't know. But uh, yeah, you you know, with like the Eradicator, I mean, you know, Dan came up with that uh, ages ago and it was even, you know, a couple of years before that uh, Death of Superman or the Return of Superman story that, that uh, he did the uh, Hank Henshaw story. So it's funny how that character is kind of woven through uh, Green Lantern. It's woven through, yeah. you know, so many different uh, DC event stories as well over the, you know, multiple years. But that I think that's a testament to the fact that we, you know, what we did was, again, impactful for people who even came into comics after that point, that they, you know, remember the characters fondly and wanted to pick up the ball and continue them some in some way or another. So, yeah, it's, it, you know, it's, it's fun. And again, it's fun that DC, you know, kind of reached out. Like in my case, I didn't work on the Eradicator. I finished my duty on Superman with Adventures 500, where they all, you know, where Superman came back mm -hmm. um, in some form, and uh, you know, just by virtue of uh, Roger Stern being too busy, and and then Jackson Geis had to had to bow out. I wound up drawing it myself and writing it, so it was fun to be, you know, included. Back then, when the books were, you know, you had four books coming out every month for the Superman titles. Uh, was it? easy i because i felt like the books were so tightly knit you like you had the little uh diamond which would tell you the order in which to read the comic books back then so you'd see man of steel had a little diamond that said 23 and then you'd see okay adventures of superman has the 24 you know that's the next part of the story you never had to wonder where you were going with it being that tightly knit together was it easier or harder for the superman creative team at the time to do their own thing um no you know what it, it was like being on a team Okay. And and comics are very collaborative anyways, but it's it was almost like being on the you know, a uh, football team, baseball team, whatever. We were kind of all in it together. We all had the same kind of goal. You know, um I think it wasn't constricting, but I don't think every creator is is you know, someone who likes doing that. I mean, I think you you know, the group that we all were kind of on the same page about stuff, we were happy to, you know, kind of collaborate with each other and, and, uh, it was never forced. I think that's the big thing. I think when someone, you know, an editorial decree that you have to do this, you have to do that. But we, you know, uh, DC fostered it with us by having, you know, bringing us to, into New York to have Superman story conferences and stuff. So we were all kind of like, I think equally, uh, we were equally invested in, in the, the, the run of all four books, because again, you know, if, if one didn't do well, I mean, presumably the numbering system helped kind of even out the sales, which yeah. was good. <clears throat> um, but yeah, the, the books were generally up until I think, you know, there's a, I guess people have this feeling like, Oh, these books were so tightly done or, you know, like one story would begin in adventures and it would continue in, but we actually didn't do it that often. I mean, we we tried to group up maybe a couple times a year for big storylines that would actually really cross over. Otherwise, we just crossed over subplots like Jimmy Olsen looking for an apartment or mm. losing his job or, or something like that. Those were the threads that kind of, I think, gave people a continuity for Metropolis or, you know, Hobbs Bay or, um, you know, that type of thing. So. Uh, we we eventually each of us would do our own kind of storyline, and I think Roger, you know, kind of staked out the Lex Luthor stuff, and I think Dan, 
kind of you know had his like when he was writing and drawing Superman there he he kind of staked out the Daily Planet stuff and you know each of the each of us kind of did a little pocket of you know that Superman world that didn't kind of necessarily uh, impose on somebody else like you know uh, that can be a problem when you're working on a book that you don't you know it's, it's situations where you're working on stuff where you don't even know the other people hmm. in our case we knew each other we were you know we were I would dare say friends, you know, uh, <laughs> in in and out of uh, that situation. So that helped a lot. Well, I know we talked to Louise Simonson at this past uh, Terrific Con, and she was so, so happy to be there with, as she said to me, her Superman pals like you <laughs> and Dan and, and Brett Breeding were all there. So she was very happy to be there at that event. So it, it seems like you really did have that great camaraderie with all of, the, all of you together. Yeah. No, and again, we're, we're, I think the team thing kind of fits with that too, because it's kind of like, we're the, you know, we're the guys who went to the Super Bowl or whatever, you mm-hmm. know, I mean, especially having, I think we all kind of had to bond over the death of Superman because it was so big, Yeah. you know, and we all kind of felt the, you know, the excitement, the pressure, the whatever. I mean, it was, it was everything within that space of time. So I think that does kind of bond you together. And, um, I mean, it's always fun to see everybody at shows, even if it's a couple people. We always wind up getting out together, go to dinner or something and, and uh, catching up. So I think that's I mean, that's always been my favorite part of comics. So I think it helps when you're when you're, you know, collaborators are also uh, people that you're friendly with that you want to hang out with. And, I, you know, I, I'm sure that doesn't always happen. And, you know, I'm sure, you know, in, in situations like uh, uh ours i felt like our situation was very natural it wasn't forced and that that may be a big part of it just the you know being able to kind of chart those stories together with the editor you know whether you were the writer or the artist you still got to say or the inker the inker's got to say as well and and glenn whitmore got to say as the colorist Hmm. so i think that that kind of was a a unique situation in, in that you know um uh, in my Carlin's office, uh, you know, that I don't know that that was the same situation that, say, the Batman guys had back when they, you know, when they had their, uh, the Ellen Grant and um, Doug Mensch, you know, those, that era. I feel like those guys probably worked more traditionally as, you know, here's your plot, here's your script, whatever. You know, it wasn't the same. Like we were, we were definitely kind of in a, in a big room together. And I think that you know, that made a big difference. So, so that being said with, with that kind of overarching structure, when the death happened, did all of you know, did, was it the, the Mike Carlin, the, who said, and one year later, we're going to bring him back. Or was it just kind of organic? Like it just happened to be a year later. Was it, was there a timetable put on these stories for Superboy and steel and the eradicator? And you all knew it was coming back in a year or how did that happen? Well, I mean, I was at the first part of that meeting, and then I think I I uh, I was only there for for the first part of it, the introduction and all the characters and all that. And I always felt like the uh, the thing that we talked about when during the death of Superman, we had we had planned it out, um, and then we had like reconvened, maybe I, I want to say a couple months after the original meeting when this when this started taking off as far as the uh, publicity and and attention and we we all kind of got together and said look we really need to make this good (laughs) you know we can't just have him show up like oh he shows up in the shower and you know like in dallas somebody's (laughs) dead you know there were there was a lot of ideas thrown around as to how he would return and i i do remember a lot of that because you know we really didn't have that part of it planned out it wasn't like oh he dies and then this happens and you know he regenerates and he comes back we didn't really have that you know we were concerned about the stories that we were working at the death of part and the funeral for a friend so um i do know that when the idea of of you know how would superman return i remember being in the room saying look this is the first time in a long, long time that people don't know what Superman will be or will look like when he comes back. So can we please put a blackout on press and also for previews, which come, you know, three months before the publication, you don't want to have the covers in there. Right. Kind of telegraphing what's actually happening. So, I mean, I think that, you know, was taken to heart and they did a lot of top secret, 
you know, blacked out pages and stuff. And they basically made the, the retailers kind of just trust us, which was kind of amazing in its own way, but I think it paid off. Um, but yeah, I think there, the, the idea was, you know, once that, like the meeting that I was at with, um, planning out the return for, you know, Adventures of Superman number 500, that came, I think that one was what I recall was that was a couple months into it. Mm-hmm. Cause I think my daughter had, she was born in, in September of 92. <laughs> and I remember her being, you know, just a couple weeks old when we had this meeting. So uh, my wife came, I think the second day and uh and then i went home with them but uh so my daughter was actually yeah, <laughs> a, a, maybe a month old she was at the meeting oh wow i think i think it was her idea yeah she said no <laughs> he shouldn't come back he should be four people <laughs> out of the mouths of babes look at that <laughs> yeah but but i do remember that and i i know that there were elements that uh you know i can't again memory is is the way it is you know everybody remembers stuff that's you know important to them i guess or specific but I do recall that everybody had good ideas, and I think, you know, Carlin um, always was smart about that stuff, and he saw that everybody had kind of come in with a good pitch for who Superman could be, and I think that is what, you know, led to them, well, why don't we do four of them and have it be a little bit of a bake-off, even though, you know, it really wasn't a bake-off. It wasn't going to be like, who's the most popular one, and that's that's the one that'll be Superman. Right. But it was... Who will the fans like the most? Who will the fans trust? You know, um, because that was a big part of it. I think as a reader, reading that that storyline, you know, as it was coming out, because I was no longer on those books, Mm -hmm. I was reading it as a fan, and I was like, wow, this is really a great follow-up. I mean, I think they, um, those guys just did a a great job with the, you know, the build up with introducing him and having each character have be slightly one personality or a part of Superman's personality and, you know, leaving the reader kind of going, wait, could th- maybe they, maybe they're all Superman or maybe none of them are Superman. So, um, and I re I reread those, uh, before I did my Eradicator story, I reread that whole storyline and I enjoyed it again as a fan 30 some years later or whatever. And you're a comic book guy, I feel like, because I've talked to so many different people. I know uh, we very sadly just lost Keith Giffen, but I remember talking to him uh, on my show. And I said, so do you have long boxes of comic books? I don't have any comic books in my house. He said, if you came into my house, you wouldn't know I, you know, wouldn't know I, what I did for a living. I have no comic <laughs> books. But, but he was such a fan, and he had a great knowledge of the books. Are, I feel like you're one of those people who've, who've got comic books at home, though. You've, you've got oh, a collection. Yeah. We're going to take a pause right there for commercial break. Before we do that, though, I want to make sure we tell you about Kokomo Toys in Kokomo, Indiana, our official toy partner. Uh, They're the ones who have been giving us all the goodies that we've been sending out for the toy trivia whenever we do those. Uh, Many of you have gotten boxes from me here at KTRS, and those are full of great toys that Kokomo Toys in Kokomo, Indiana has sent me to give away because they partner with us on these giveaways, and I'm very grateful they do. If you've not been to Kokomo Toys in Kokomo, Indiana, you need to go. If you're like, let's say you're going to visit relatives this holiday season, a lot of people go out of town to do that, like my friend Joey V., uh, maybe you're driving through Indiana for some reason. Maybe you got relatives in Ohio or Pennsylvania. Make a pit stop at Kokomo Toys in Kokomo, Indiana. Check the website to make sure they're open. Don't go by there if they're not open, obviously. But if you do go by there, they've got something for everyone. Anyone who's a collector of, I'd say, anything geek, nerd, toy related, they have it. Toys from the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s, the 10s. And now they've got a bunch of stuff, loose toys, box toys, vintage toys, just beautiful toys. I mean, (laughs) I could go on and on. Literally, like we we drove down there when I first went there from Holland, Michigan on a vacation. We popped in while we're on the way and I could have spent the day there just browsing at all the cool stuff they've got. It's amazing. Follow them on social media because they do, whoever their social media team is, do a great job job the the instagram posts the stuff they put on twitter uh facebook obviously it's kokomo toys in kokomo indiana if you ever get a chance go by there they are our partners here on geek to me radio do all our toy giveaways for us we're very thankful for them and all that they do if you get a chance check them out kokomo toys tell them you heard about it on geek to me radio with that said we're going to take this commercial break we'll come right back chatting more jerry ordway you're listening to geek to me radio please stand by Hi, 
Hi, this is George Newbern, the voice of Superman. You are listening to Geek to Me Radio. We are back. Geek to Me Radio heard here every Sunday night on the Big 550 KTRS, sometimes with video when Joey V is in studio with me on YouTube and Facebook. So make sure you check out Facebook.com slash Geek to Me Radio and hit the like button on that page there. And also find us on YouTube, Geek to Me Radio. Search that out on YouTube. Hit the button there to follow us, please. Subscribe, please. We appreciate that a great deal. We're trying to get to 1,000 subscribers. It's been a slog. I'm not sure what YouTube, the algorithms are or what they are, but you can help us out by subscribing. Hit that little notification bell so you get a little bing every time we go live so you know when we're doing video. And when we're both in studio, uh, Joey V sets that up and makes the show run like a dream. So I'm very grateful to all of his help. For all of his help, I should say. I, I'm having a hard time talking tonight. I'm not sure if you noticed. But uh, yeah, give us a follow on YouTube. We do appreciate it. We're trying to get those numbers up there as well. And uh, hit the bell. You'll be notified when we go live. Which tonight, it's pre-recorded. I'm not in studio. Joey B's not in studio. But this is a brand new show. We're chatting with Jerry Ordway. Talking about his work on the Return of Superman 30th anniversary. Before we get into that rest of that conversation, we will make sure we tell you about our premier sponsor, the Greater St. Charles Convention and Visitors Bureau. Of course, discoverstcharles.com. As I mentioned earlier in the show, Christmas Traditions is now going full tilt out there starting on Friday. Uh, Black Friday they started. They'll be going all the way through Christmas Eve. So you have the month of December, the entire month to come out and interact with your favorite people out there. Jack Frost, the Sugar Plum Fairy, the Victorian carolers singing period songs, the USO Evergreen singers, and great groups like that. You get to hang out uh, talk to the chestnut roasters, get some hot roasted chestnuts, some wassail from the Maids of Milk, and it's a great time to go out there and celebrate the season in a proper Victorian fashion. It's f- just phenomenal fun. I mean, there's the, it's the longest running and the biggest Christmas festival in the country for a reason, because they put it on every year and do a great job. This is their 49th season. Crazy to think about. They're coming up on their big 50th anniversary, and they'll be doing something big next year, I'm sure, for that, but it's always a good time to go out and see our friends out in St. Charles. Uh, whether you're from out of town, whether you're local, give them a website. Uh, give the, Again, I told you I cannot talk. Give their website a visit. This is what I meant to say. DiscoverStCharles.com. That's DiscoverStCharles.com. And see all the fun there is to do. If you're from out of town, as I mentioned, there's plenty of places to stay. You want a five-star hotel, they got it. You want a bed and breakfast, maybe you're kind of going on a romantic holiday getaway with your significant other, they've got you covered. Little cold, but if you're into the camping in the cold, they got you covered. Again, uh, RV parks, no matter what you want, they've got it. And the food's incredible. Uh, It just looks beautiful, decked out for the holidays like this with the lights and the trees. And it's it's just a fantastic time. So if you're tired of the hustle and bustle of the malls, you want a new experience for Christmas, check out Christmas Traditions in St. Charles. That website again, discoverstcharles.com. As we always say, it's an historically good time. Right before we took that first commercial break, we were chatting with Jerry Ordway and we asked him about his uh, comic book collection. Yeah, I think I have too many. <laughs> <laughs> Never enough, in my opinion. But <laughs> it's like you you, you do definitely think about it, and you go, "Well, how many how many uh, you know rooms can I dedicate to right. boxes of comics?" You know? <laughs> Depends on the, you need to get a larger house, obviously. If you're yeah, not that, that way, you can dedicate more rooms. <laughs> so, as but as yeah, a no, person, I, I, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say I, I, I like comics since I was a little kid. So I think um, that love of comics has never gone away you know i still go to the comic store every wednesday and and uh i still buy a ton of stuff you know <laughs> so i'm i'm a current reader as well i just feel like you know even if you're just keeping up with the industry if you're in the industry it's good but i'm still a fan of stuff so i, th- I think that that type of attitude always to me i mean i would you know I'm, I'm conscious of everything i do i mean while i'm doing it i'm trying to give somebody their money's worth, you know? Yeah. I mean, um, and I think Giffen, someone like Keith was, he might've been kind of proud to make comments <laughs> like, I don't have any comics or whatever. <laughs> he may not have, but I guarantee you, he was, you know, a, a nerd comic fan. Oh know, yeah, absolutely. Bone. You could tell. You know, yeah. You just don't, I mean, I don't think you can have that level of fun in your work um, without just, being into it, you know. 
Yeah, you I can't agree. fake that. And if you'd asked, I, I went through my other interviews because we've had you on the show a couple of times now just to make sure I hadn't asked this question previously, and I hadn't. So if you had gone back, little seven-year-old Jerry Ordway, if you said, hey, when you grew up, you're going to be able to write and draw comic books, what character do, would you think of yourself as being so closely associated with the characters you've done like Captain Marvel and Superman? Or would you, as little tiny Jerry Ordway have said, no, I want to draw up and I want to draw a Hulk or I want to write, you yeah. know, what was it you were into as a kid? Yeah. When I was a kid, especially, you know, discovering Marvel Comics at, uh, I think I was probably nine or something. Um, I, once I got into Marvel, I was a Daredevil, Spider-Man, Avengers. Those were my three. So I, I think it, as a kid, if I ever even dreamed that it was possible to do comics, I would have thought that I would be doing, you know, drawing Spider-Man or, or, you know, the Avengers or something. And, and, uh, you know, Daredevil, those are characters that I've, I did a little Avengers. I've drawn Spider-Man in like, you know, maximum security. I've done a couple of figures of Daredevil and other things. But, uh, yeah, if I, if I were time traveling, I would be totally stunned to <laughs> realize that I wound up doing, uh, you know, like, kind of important stuff on Superman and Captain Marvel Shazam and even the JSA, you know, yeah. I, I oh my gosh. Yeah. Surprised. <clears throat> but, uh, yeah, you, I mean, I think that's the key though, in a way I, I always felt like the saving grace to me doing Superman was that I really, I, I was familiar with Superman and I didn't dislike Superman. My experience with Superman was mostly tied up with watching the uh, 1950s show, in reruns when yeah. I was a kid on UHF channels or whatever in Milwaukee and the Superman movie for, you know, the first movie, uh, which I saw probably four or five times mm. in theaters, you know, um, that was just huge. And when that happened, I mean, the Superman movie came out in 77. So I was already, you know, I was 20 years old. So I was, you know, um, I was an adult, <laughs> you know, it, just, it impacted me in a different way than I think if I had been a little kid or if I'd been a teenager, even it impacted me more from the romantic point of view and the, uh, you know, the, um, the kind of man out of, you know, not out of time, but the, uh, uh, the, the character of Clark being kind of out of step because he's got these powers and he knows he's not like everybody else, but yet he grew up like everybody else, you know? Um, those are the things that I think I really took to, and I think I tried hardest to incorporate into, into the Superman that I did. So I think it was important in a way, like sometimes creators will be really big fans of something and they, Oh, I, I I've got to do this when I'm, you know, when I grow up, I'm going to do this and this, sometimes you could be too close to it. So I think, you know, like if I were 20 years old, maybe I would have been a little too, nerdy about doing spider-man or uh, avengers or daredevil or something you know i think that y it's harder to have like a, a a separation from your you know your kid nerd wants sure and, and yeah. be able to see something for like here's the concept so like i didn't see superman as a superhero comic as much as i saw it as a drama about somebody who finds out that he's adopted you know yeah i mean th that those aspects of that character always struck me very, very strongly. And I think that was probably what made my run a little bit more personal feeling, mm -hmm. you know, um, than it would have been if I just was, oh, I'm a really huge fan and I got to draw the parasite or I got to draw, you know what I mean? I think that, yeah, that, it makes sense. You know, it makes you think about stuff differently, I guess. Um, but uh, yeah, and, and Captain Marvel, those are both those characters I was familiar with. And I mean, with Captain Marvel, I got to do a little bit of Captain Marvel when I was doing All-Star Squadron, um, just on a couple of covers, really. I, I think DC couldn't really use them in the main comic back then because they had to pay Fawcett like $100, whether he was in one panel or a whole in Oh, my gosh. Issue. And and it was like, well, we're not, you know, if, if the story really revolves around him, we'll do that. But if not, so he really wasn't in any of those giant group shots in All-Star Squadron where he could have been if they didn't have to pay for each wow. other. I had no idea. Wow. Yeah, that's what the deal was up until DC outright bought the the uh, character in the, I think, later 80s. They just 
bought lock, stock, and barrel. But before that, they paid a fee to uh, the Fawcett um, family of something like I think it was a hundred dollars for for the character to be in a you know guest star in a comic. Um, maybe more if he was in his own comic. But uh, yeah, it was uh, it was an interesting. <laughs> <laughs> and I will say I'm a very stubborn person. It is Captain Marvel. The wizard's name is Shazam, so I'm right, just that's right. a hill I'm willing to die on. In case anyone's yeah, listening, I mean, I, I don't mean I don't want to confuse anybody. <laughs> no, but but yeah, I, can, I mean, yeah, I, I see. I always the character is Captain Marvel. We called the book the Power of Shazam, and I, you know, when I was doing it, the only restriction we had was we couldn't call him Captain Marvel on the cover, and we got, you know, I think Marvel gave us permission for the first issue. And that's the, the only time it says Captain Marvel. This is the original Captain Marvel, I think, on issue one of Power Shazam. <clears throat> um, and that was by virtue of the fact that Mark Grunwald was, you know, Mike Carlin's best buddy in, at, at Marvel. So they, they mm. had a gentleman's agreement about it. Oh, that's nice. I Again, I didn't know that. That's why I like having yeah. you on, Jerry. I always learn so much <laughs> about, the, about the nitty-gritty of all I the comic stuff. I could be making stuff. it all up, though, you know? <laughs> well, I, I'm going to take it on faith that you're not... <laughs> With uh, you mentioned Daredevil being one of your early on favorites, I'm wondering was there anything about Daredevil that that street level uh, kind of a superhero thing that influenced Gangbuster at all? You know, it's funny though. I'm sure I'm sure there was a part of that. You know, just that idea of the guy who was, uh, you know, ath- athletic and acrobatic or whatever. But I think Gangbuster, you know, on its surface, Gangbuster really was created because we couldn't use the Guardian. Mm. And uh, I really wanted to use the Guardian, but they would put like a moratorium on the Kirby characters in the first, I think it was the first full year, because Roger Stern and uh, Ron Friends and Brett Breeding were introducing them, I think, in the Superman annual, which was coming out at the end of the first year. Ah, okay. So they had a moratorium on it, and I went, well, you know, this is something, you know, they, it's a new character, you know. And I, I pushed really hard, even though it, there was a lot of resistance. And uh, um, at the time, Marv didn't really want to want to do it. He I remember him saying, like, uh, you know, oh, he's a teacher, but that's just like Black Lightning. And I'm like, well, why can't he be a teacher? <laughs> you know? Yeah. It feels like you know that that that's not a bad thing. You know, it's a guy who's who's in a, working in a bad neighborhood and is, you know, deciding that he he needs to try to do something about it personally you know, uh, by becoming a hero or whatever. So, um, but yeah, the, uh, the, the idea of the ground level kind of hero to me was more about him being a super strong contrast against Superman mm-hmm. because the Superman comic, obviously Superman, super powerful. He can do so many things. If you think about it too hard, you can kind of ruin, ruin whatever story because it's like, well, he's super fast. He could, you know, zip around here and prevent every, every crime. Um, Gangbuster was somebody who was going to be ground street level character as a contrast to the fact that, okay, Superman can't be everywhere at, at the same time. Some, something's going to fall in the, you know, through the cracks. So, so, uh, um, Suicide Slum or Hobbs Bay needs their, you know, hero as well. And, and that also gets, you know, you get to play a little bit with the idea that you have a vigilante, um, like a Batman or whatever, you have somebody who's not working outside of the law, whereas Superman's kind of, you know, almost like an honorary military, uh, honor, honorary police. Yeah. You know, he's, he's certainly got some uh, uh, ability to, to not be the bad guy or, or to be, you know, not considered a, an official. <laughs> yeah, right. So, yeah, those were just themes that I think were, were good. And uh, those were also themes that kind of grew out of me loving the, wacky Jack Kirby, um, Jimmy Olsen comic from the seventies <laughs> when Kirby had come over to, to DC because there was one story in there that I just, I remember reading that as a, maybe, I guess I would have been a teen at that point, but there was a story where Superman, I think it was in the first issue. Superman is, is meeting some, the champion, the boxing champion of the world or whatever, and the guy, you know, is, is standing to, up to Superman. He goes, look, you know, next to you, I'm nothing. <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, I'm, I may be the boxing champion, but, you you know, you can push planets around or something. And, and Kirby just did that as a, I think, a really little couple panel sequence. But it reminds you that 
there's Superman and there's everybody else, you know? Um, so I think that was always important that the, you know, that for, for Superman and for Metropolis and all that is to have some kind of contrast to show, um, that, you know, everything's not perfect and some things are going to fall through the cracks and as strong and powerful as Superman is, he can't be everywhere. Right. And, uh, even though he died, he did return the death of Superman 30th anniversary last year. We're now following that at the return of Superman 30th anniversary. It's out in comic book shops this month. So make sure you go out and get it. Uh, ask your local comic book store if they have it. Uh, and I'm sure if they don't, they can get it for you. As we wrap up the interview here, uh, was there were there any loose ends looking back on your run? I know, like you said earlier, your run ended with Adventures 500. Uh, your last issue as the writer on that one was. Were there any loose ends you kind of wanted to tie up before you had let go of the Superman titles, or did you kind of feel like my work here is done? I'm leaving it, and I like where I've left it. <laughs> we're going to take another quick commercial break. We'll come right back and wrap up our conversation with the great Jerry Ordway. You're listening to Geek to Me Radio on the Big 550 KTRS. Please stand by. Yes, 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 yes. We're back. Geek to Me Radio. I'm your host, James Enstall. Hope you're all full of turkey and stuffing and you're having those leftovers tonight and you're hanging out, having a great time as you listen to Geek to Me Radio here on the Big 550 or streaming online, depending on where you are and how you're listening. Talking with Jerry Ordway. Before we get back to that conversation, I want to make sure we tell you about our official comic book sponsor because, you know, we talk about the works here that Jerry Ordway's got, his uh, Death of Superman 30th anniversary from last year. Maybe you missed that and maybe you didn't get out to get that 30th anniversary return of Superman that we're talking about now. Great place to get those comics and any other comics you might want, Bugs, Comics, and Games. You can check them out on Bryan Road in O'Fallon, Missouri. Easily accessible from either the page extension or from Highway 70. Just zip on out there. Uh, back issues galore. I, that's one of the things I always say is it, you're not a real comic book store if you don't have back issues, which they've got them. Believe me, Bugs has a lot on hand. New comics, obviously. Bags and boards. They've got Pokemon cards. They've got toys. They've got vintage games. All sorts of cool stuff. It, it's just something you need to go out there and see for yourself because it's one of those things where you can buy stuff online. You can shop on the online stores and you go on eBay, but you don't know what you're getting. You never know the quality. Is it really a VF condition? Larry's a very accurate grader. So if he says it's this quality condition, that's the condition you're getting. Plus, you get to see it. You don't have to pay shipping charges. Just go and check him out at Bugs Comics and Games. Browse through the store. Take your time. Look over the stuff. And while you're there, join the Avengers Club. It gets expensive during this time of year, especially because you're buying gifts for everyone else. You have personal property tax to pay at the end of the year. Save some money. Join the Avengers Club. That way you don't have to sacrifice your hobby. You get to save money on all the comic books and all the toys and all the back issues and everything else I just mentioned while you enjoy your collection. The Avengers Club, it's easy to join. Ask Larry for details. Once you get there, just say, hey, I want to join the Avengers Club and start saving money on my comic books, and he will set you up. Check them out on Instagram, Bugs, Comics, and A-N-D, Games, on Instagram. And give this Facebook page a like, Bugs, Comics, and Games, on Facebook as well. He's always posting there, and he's going to be starting to do more on Instagram. So you can see all the cool stuff he's got in his store there as well. Bugs, Comics, and Games, very proud to have them as the official comic book sponsor here on geek to me Radio. Speaking of comics, we're talking with Jerry Ordway. 30th anniversary of the return of Superman. One year after his death, the Man of Steel is back. We're asking, obviously, Jerry about his work on the series, and we mentioned he, he wrapped it up with Adventures of Superman number 500, and we asked him, were there any loose ends that you kind of wanted to wrap up that you didn't get the chance to? Yeah, I was happy with where I left it. I, I also think that there being a, uh, all these books are ongoing series it's kind of i don't know if it's fair to try to wrap up things in a mm -hmm. way you know what i mean like even uh, my hope was that characters like bibbo and um gangbuster and cat grant and all those characters would live on that's the that's always the i think the the dream of creating something that has some staying power and um so i don't really I, I, one of the things that i did i did come back at some point i think in 98 
I came back and I was dialoguing um, Adventures of Superman over Carl Kiesel's plots. And I did find that I missed those characters. Hmm. And um, I was, <laughs> it's just like this is a story for another time, but I was going to, to take over Adventures again when Carl was done. And then, you know, DC changed editors and then they, they canned a bunch of people and it Oof. didn't happen. But I always felt like those, you know, the, like doing this story that I did with the Eradicator, it's a Perry White kind of centric story. It was so easy to slip right back into it because it really doesn't feel like I'd been away from it. I think, you know, um, that's kind of the joy of being, I guess, so kind of entrenched and familiar with the, you know, the basics of those characters. It, it, it was just really fun jumping back in. Uh, without really feeling like I'd been away for a really long time. So hmm. uh, I enjoyed that a lot. I mean, I, I, I had a, uh, a lot of fun. You know, the first time I, I drew Perry White in this thing, I was like, oh, yeah, this is what I did. This is how, <laughs> here's the character. Because I always used to try to, Byrne had kind of tried to draw him. He gave him a little bit of a Jack Kirby look to him. Yeah. Uh, and And I always thought that was kind of fun. So I always tried to keep that. So I just went, you know, went back and looked at some of my other previous issues from the, you know, from the 80s and 90s. And uh, I just went, OK, yep, that's it. That's and, and it was just very simple, you know, process from there to uh, to, to start working on it. Um, but, uh, yeah, the whole issue is fun. The other thing I was going to mention is that there's in the in the story itself, uh, each of us did a 12 page chunk. So it's it's. You know, there's a framing device and then these kind of flashbacks. The framing device is set in present day continuity. The flashbacks are, you know, Eradicator and uh, Steel and, you know, uh, it, all the four characters and each of the teams did that. And then towards the end of the story, we each did almost like a handoff thing where uh, Jurgens did one page. Bogdanov did the next, I did the next, Grummet did the next. So it was like kind of the progression, kind of what they did and we did in the uh, um, at the end of Adventures 500 in a way where each of the teams did a one page intro of the character. Well, we did a one page with mostly with you know centric to each of the characters that we did in the story. So um, that was kind of fun, and those are all part of the actual you know the new part of the story, the in continuity, current continuity stuff. So, but, uh, so maybe that's the type of stuff that's fun. Again, at, we always wind up setting up stuff like that just to, um, kind of basically riff off each other. Cause that's the one thing that was fun in the old days is that on Saturdays we would get a FedEx package from DC with all the work that had been turned in that week. Hmm. And you would get to look at, oh, here, Dan Jurgens did his 10 pages of layouts or whatever, and Bogdan did his pages. You get to look at everybody's stuff, and it was kind of inspiring, and it made, you know, it brought out the comp competitive spirit as well. And that's a big part of, I think, what um, made those books good was that we all could see what the other guy was doing. You know, so it was like if someone did this amazing panel, it'd be like, oh, man, I really got to up my game and do something it really was like a, a competitive thing in a good way. You know, um, I think it made us all kind of aware of what everybody else was doing and also then trying to do our best work. Um, so that, and that was a unique situation again, just the fact that we, you know, we were all part of a, of a team, you know, of a group kind of thing. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and I think that's uh, one of the reasons that I, I really think that that nineties era uh, late eighties and early nineties was such a renaissance for Superman just because of the, the storytelling, the, the art, I picture all those gorgeous covers and uh, it's, it's very fun that DC comics is paying homage to that time with the return of Superman for the 30th. My very last question I'm going to ask you only because you mentioned cat grant. And I don't think I've asked you this before either. How did you like close to Flockhart's portrayal of cat grant in the first season of Supergirl? Oh, it was cool. It was cool. I think, um, it was fun to see, I mean, the, the character, the way we did it, I think we, we actually did a fairly, you know, we started out with kind of a cliche kind of character. She was meant just to be a rival for Lois, but more or less she liked Clark and Lois liked Superman. So, yeah. um, 
but I think over the, the course of, of, you know, the time I was working on it, at least, it, we, we tried to do something and make her into a, a real valid character. So it's kind of fun to see little bits and pieces of that when it winds up in other media. I mean, in uh, Lois and Clark TV show, mm-hmm. she was a little bit more, um, I mean, she wasn't on it for more than the first season, unfortunately, so she didn't really get to do a lot of of character uh, growth or whatever. But I think the Callista Flockhart was much more, you know, there was more, I think, over that whole you know season. And she was in the second season as a guest star, I guess. But um, you introduced the son, and there was like there were a bunch of bits in there that that did feel like they were reading, they were reading a comic, <laughs> you know. That always um, helps when they pay attention to the source material, in my opinion. <laughs> I, I think so. I mean, again, you can use it or not, but I think it's worth reading it and then understanding it. I think that's that's a key for anybody doing it, adapting to anything, you know. But uh, yeah, no. The, the, when you when you see these things on TV, it it it's a different thing in a way. I think from like a comic fan can go, oh, somehow this validates the character because they're in live action. I don't really feel that way, but I do feel like it's nice when you can see that they were paying attention or, you know what I mean? That's, yeah. I think that's the best compliment they could pay you is that if they're going to use a character, they're just, they're not going to just totally reinvent it and use the name or something. So, right. Yeah. Um, and that's, uh, like I said, the, the, your imprint, it's gotta be so gratifying to know that you've had this imprint on this major character and hopefully we'll see more of this, uh, you know, the stuff that you and Dan and Louise and Roger have done in the Superman continuity now that they're going forward and under James Gunn's direction. Hopefully he's smart enough to pay attention to all the stuff that you and the team around you have done and bring that into the DCU uh, in the movies. I still want to see Bibbo. <laughs> yes. <laughs> who would, just out of curiosity, if they were to do it on the big screen, who would you cast? Do you have anyone in mind, oh, like a current actor? Well, because it's James Gunn, I would immediately immediately thought like Michael Rooker is ah, perfect. Yes, because <laughs> he's got that kind of. I think he could play the humor and also this slightly because fr- Bibbo's a funny character, but he's he's seriously he's a scary guy. Yeah, you, were, you know. So I think I think uh, Rooker would be great. Um, but yeah, it's just it, it that would be fun only in that. Uh, you know, it depends on how far, how deep they go with uh, with any of this supporting cast, you know? Yeah. Um, well, we'll see. You never know. Uh, uh, hopefully he seems like he, he seems like a fan based on all the tweets and everything <laughs> I've seen him do. So hopefully he'll do uh, Superman justice. I, I loved I know you and I talked about this when we saw each other at Trivicon. I, I loved everything that Henry Cavill has as an actor and brings to the role. But I just feel like he didn't get a decent script. Yeah. Very sad. Yeah, he's, it's a shame. I mean, again, that's the. I guess there's this, a bit, a little bit of a curse involved with that because I, I always felt like Christopher Reeve brought more than people deserved to that part to that role, and and really the the scripts kind of failed him after a while. Yeah, he would still be great in the in the portrayal, but you know the the movies themselves kind of just were not great after the. To me, they were not great after the first one. And a lot of people like the second one. I'm not a big fan, but um, with Cavill, I think Cavill really embodied that character, and I think he had the right look. And I think he had, you know, from what little I know, reading about him, I think he had the right attitude about it. He did get the character, but you know, in a way, I think DC, not DC, but Warner, shortchanged him by not doing Man of Steel too. You know, I yeah. really think that's the biggest the biggest problem because they jump, they jump the character kind of ahead in the space of one movie to have him be a Superman at the end of his career <laughs> rather than, right. you know what I mean? Right. Uh, so they kind of robbed him of, of some of that. And, and I, you know, I think both he and uh, I mean, the, the, the romance between him and Lois in the movies was really great. And it was very, to me, it felt, it felt very adult and I appreciated that. And I think as fans, we kind of got cheated in a way just by uh, by virtue of, of what the – and I don't think you can blame the, you know, the director because Warner basically saw the Avengers come out and make you know a billion – over a billion dollars. And it's like that's what we want. Yep. We're jump, jump-starting this, you know. Yeah, thing. fast forward straight instead of – it would have been like yeah. Marvel going from Iron Man and then doing Avengers and not yeah. build in between. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, and that's, you know, uh, at the time, everybody who was a comic fan was like, how can they do this in such a short space? You know, you really are kind of shortchanging. But they, Superman especially, I think, got shortchanged. And, um, you know, that's the way it goes. So yeah. um, I, I, do, I do have high hopes for uh, James Gunn. Um, I think he, you know, he's a talented uh, filmmaker. I think he'll have a, a unique perspective on it. I'm sure it won't be exactly what everybody's thinking it's going to be either, which is kind of fun. So, yeah. But, we um, shall see. Yep. Um, if people want to keep up with more of you, I know you're fairly active on social media. Is Twitter the best way or Facebook, yeah, Instagram? I'm, on, I'm, on, I'm still on Twitter. I'm on, I, I am on this, I guess it's, is it blue sky or blue ski? I don't even know. <laughs> yeah, I think it's blue sky. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, uh, I'm on there. I just haven't done as much on there yet, but, uh, uh, I still show up on Twitter and I still answer questions if people have specifics. I always try to re- respond to messages and things like that. So, And we're very glad that you do. Uh, Jerry Ordway, I appreciate your time tonight. Thanks so much. Thank you. That is going to do it, my friends. Another show in the book. Huge thanks to Jerry Ordway for taking time to sit down and chat with me. Just a gracious gentleman, a fantastic talent, and I'm so thrilled that I've gotten the chance to know him over the past few years here. Uh, If you go to Terrific Con, make sure you go say hi to him. He's a staple there, and you can get your cool stuff autographed. I'm going to bring my uh, Return of the Jedi variant covers from the recent Star Wars run so I can get those all signed and CGC graded by him next time I see him at Terrific Con. So if you're listening to this, Jerry, I'm going to have him with me this year. I forgot <laughs> I forgot in this past year, but I'll see you with them in 2024. Uh, thanks, as always, to Joey V for making this show sound and look as good as it does. Thank you again to our sponsors and partners, Kokomo Toys in Kokomo, Indiana, Bugs Comics and Games in O'Fallon, Missouri, and, of course, the Greater St. Charles Convention and Visitors Bureau, discoverstcharles.com. That's going to do it. Until next week, my friends. It's not a new- Thank you, Smallville. Good night. Hey, kids. Are your parents about to buy you a shiny new toy from Amazon? Hi, I'm Chucky. Want to play? Well, don't be selfish. Share some of that money with us. Before going on Amazon, make sure to type in bit.ly slash geek to me in the web browser. It will look just like Amazon.com, except it'll say referral geek to me radio up top. And then when you check out, a tiny percentage will go to support the show without costing you one cent more. So before your parents get you that gizmo, gadget, or widget, make sure they type in bit.ly slash geek to me in the web browser bit.ly slash geek to me bit.ly slash geek to me